I enjoy exploring the thought of Alan Watts for many reasons. One of, one of the things I enjoy is to contrast my own way of exploring problems with his. And that's something we used to do years ago when I knew him. This is a very interesting work called Beyond Theology because he does something curious in Beyond Theology. He goes beyond it because he explains it. Right. To go beyond is really to explain it, and let me add a word, to explain it away. And he's very aware of this in the work he quotes indirectly, the a uh, very interesting Archbishop of Dublin. And I think this is really something that the Archbishop of Dublin would take exception to. Alan Watts is beyond theology. Let me give you a quote. I'm on page 11. An Archbishop of Dublin is reported to have said of the church, you may persecute us, we are quite used to that. You may argue with us and attack us. We know very well how to handle ourselves. But the one thing we will not tolerate is that you should explain us. And that's what he does. He explains it. Now, there's a problem in explaining it away because the thing that you're going to explain are essentially ideas, a class of ideas that are also symbols. And these symbols also have roots in images. And the play between ideas and symbols and images is the intellectual life of man. Alan, Alan Watts is very clear about the way in which he proceeds. And he proceeds primarily, primarily, major focus, is on images. That's the way he proceeds. And the way he describes the way he approaches religions is that a religion is just like a rose should be studied just like a rose, a natural phenomena, study it. But then he says, not only must you study it, it's not, uh, it's a multifaceted thing, this curious thing called the religion. And there are parts of it which are obscure and you have to bring light to it. And the only way you can bring light to it for Alan Watts is to make a comparative study of it. So what you do is you, you use one to throw light on the other. He sees religions as a multifaceted thing which has different, different parts to it, some more obscure than others, but they all have basically the same kind of things. And therefore, if one religion is able to illuminate one side more than another, you use that to illuminate the other. And therefore, that gives him a basis for seeing different religions through one another to get a unity, but then he takes that unity and returns to the particular religion he's interested in and restructures it. Now, therefore, Alan says, the most interesting way to proceed, the way he proceeds, is to go the mythic, go by the mythical, go by the mythical, go by, it's, of course it's naive, take it on a naive mythical level, go to the imagistic, Look at the anthropomorphic side of religion, because that's where a great deal of the images are. In other words, go backwards. Go backwards. Go for the images. Find how they become symbols. See the ideas behind them. 
And when there is anything obscure in the way in which the ideas are structured or function, go to the comparative analysis and see how they're being used in other religions. Take that insight, return to the basic problem you have, and proceed. Now, he has a very nice way of expressing it. He says the connection, the connections and relationships between ideas represent methods of thinking based upon symbolic correspondences, which we no longer use in our reasoning. Look here, that's very interesting. Let me unpack it. See, the problem that we all face, and Alan is really an expert and intuitive genius in this respect, is that the symbols in Christianity, the basic symbol, the most important symbols in Christianity, have their roots in a past that is simply not alive to us. It's not part of our traditions. And therefore, since it's not alive to us, we approach those symbols in a very confused way. Because unless those symbols have the vitality that can disclose their roots, much like Chinese calligraphy still maintains its roots behind the symbol, unless you have that, you can't make sense of the symbols of your own religion. So therefore, we have a particularly difficulty, particularly great difficulty. See, if our thinking is based upon symbols or symbolic correspondences, and if these are no longer in use in our reasoning, then we have lost touch with our own systems. And this, of course, is a quote from Alan. Now, let me see if I can make that clearer. Right. Alan, as a communicator, has a great gift. He, is a, he has a great sense of humor. He can capture the ridiculous in words. He can make what appears to be the simplistic. He can show the mystery behind it. He can represent that most clearly. Here's the way he does it. He's talking about Christianity. He's talking about the need to go beyond theology. And he says, you know what's curious about Christianity? Nobody, nobody, nobody can believe it. That's where he starts. Nobody can believe it. That's, that's quite true. What? It is. And then he says, you know what? Not only can it believe, it isn't believed either. Literally. He says, look, the example he uses is, if you really believe there's a de demon that's present, an archangel, a fiend, and it's ever-present, and it's occupying every little opportunity to invade your presence and dictate its own ends upon yours, he says, then, then that's an understanding of the mythic element in Christianity. He says, no one believes that today. We don't believe that, unless you happen to have a mental problem. Now, since it can't be believed and isn't believed, literally, then why doesn't he leave it? Why doesn't he leave it? And the reason he doesn't leave it, you see, is because the past is alive in Alan Watts' thinking. He has done his homework. He has explored the roots, and therefore he can return to Christianity with a full knowledge of the roots. And therefore, for him, it's a vital thing. Now, he even expresses it in this way. He has his vision, and his vision is uh, oh, that's, a, that's not a, I must have missed a word there. Let me make sure I have it right, okay? Um, what did I put there? Oh, my, my regret, I'm on page 84. My regret is rather that we shall never see the rich potentialities of this way of life fulfilled, nor realize that the Christian mythos has the possibility of blossoming into the most joyously exuberant 
swinging, colorful, and liberated re religion that there ever was. Heaven need not wait for the grave. Now look, look, look. My regret is that we shall never see the full potentialities of this way of life fulfilled. For him, the Christian mythos has the possibility of blossoming into the most joyous, exuberant, swinging, colorful, and liberated religion of them all. Look, wait a minute. He's, Alan starts, therefore, with the admission that on one level, nobody believes it, literally, and it can't be believed. And at the same time, he says, look here, it has the potentiality of being the most significant and the most colorful, the most meaningful religion of them all. Well, that's the challenge of the book. He has to deliver that. That's his promise. That's his IOU. Now, in order to do that, he redefines for himself key words, ritual. He says, what is a ritual? Before, he's going to show you the full richness of Christianity. He says, ritual is love. Entering in with a spirit of love and awareness and reverence for all things. That's ritual. That's what a ritual really is. To be able to enter into it with love and awareness and reverence. For what? For all. For all things. Now, if he does that, if he then, that, see, he has the kind of a mind, well, that's the way he functions. He returns to the Christian thought, that was his basic religion, with a, an awareness and a reverence and a love. So he approaches Christi Christianity in the very term that he uses in describing ritual. For the rest of us, we've lost our roots. We've lost it. As a matter of fact, it might even be best to say our culture lost it, not that we've lost it, because we don't keep alive those roots. Therefore, it's a need to return to the mythic level. He said, look here, let's return to the mythos. Let's get into the imagery. Let's participate in the rituals in the way in which he says it, and in the sacraments. Now, what is a sacrament? He has a very simple, very simple way of describing it in a sacrament. He says, you know what? We are changed by what we consume. What I consume, I am changed by it. And as a consequence of that, my belief structure is completely restructured. What is it? What's the sacrament? It's what you can consume, what you consume, you are changed by it. You're changed by what you can consume, and that changes your whole belief structure. If you grasp that, he says, that's what a sacrament is. Now, Notice, that's a different way of looking at sacraments and rituals, but he's going to bring this together. I'd like to show you how he does it. And in doing it, has a little bit of fun sharing it with you. He starts with a discussion on bread and wine. He says, this is a, the, something we're all aware of. We have a certain image of it. Works up now, works up, works up. Has a certain image. He says, bread and wine, what are they? <clears throat> now, his approach to understanding this, we will later talk about, as he gives it a name, and that is he understands it in terms of system theory. Right? Ah. And for those of you who want to get into system theory, there's a great website. The Santa Fe Institute has one uh, where they're exploring systems. System theory is a way of understanding systems as a class, finding a commonality between systems, and it's a very interesting way of exploring ideas. This is an example of it. He says, take bread and wine. What does bread involve? It presupposes a process. There must have been people going out, and they must have collected, right? They had to collect it, right? They had to collect the grain. 
They had to go out and work. They had to go out and work. Then they had to grind it. Then they had to bake it. Wine. It's grapes. Again, you have to go out and work. You have to collect it. You have to then go through a crushing process. Then it has to be fermented. It involves, therefore, us totally. It can involve our entire community, or a nice part of it. Therefore, through that work, we can see then in the way in which it functions as a whole system that it represents ourselves. We've gotten involved in it. It's our flesh and blood. It's our flesh and blood that has been become involved. And by consuming bread and wine, that's the, right, we then find ourselves participating in what we ourselves have produced from nature. It's been transformed by it. And therefore, we can participate and on the highest level, the, the pro our own products and be transformed by them. It makes a step now. So, our work represents ourselves, our flesh and blood. Now he's moved to the level of symbol. Now he's moved to the level of symbol. And now he's going to talk about blood. And he's going to say blood is very interesting, especially in the New Testament and the Old Testament. He said blood is really the essence of life. And um, I'm not sure he quotes it. I should check, but I'm sure you're familiar in chapter 9 in the Genesis. Uh, Noah is instructed about what he can consume in the garden, pardon me, on the, after the garden. And he's told he can eat of these plants and, and these animals, but not the blood. He cannot consume the blood. The blood, you see, is the essence of life, and therefore God prohibits them eating of the blood. Therefore, from this comes a whole way of looking at blood. Right? It gains on a symbolic value. It's the essence of life. If you can eat it, by implication, it's only that which is God's, the essence of life. In that sense, then, it can be said, then, that in some way God, is the, God finds the sacred. He alone, it is his domain. It's his domain. All right. Well, if it's his domain, it's his. And we make a rule that we never consume it. Therefore, all animals that are slaughtered, we have to make sure that the blood then drains on the earth. It must spill on the earth. But we must not consume it. And therefore, we don't eat anything that, we have, that has blood in it until it has been drained, drained to the soil. Oh, over the years now, this gains great significance. Now, uh, let me stay on that for, for a moment here. He's now reached the level of symbols, bread and wine. He equates, therefore, recalls its connection with the blood, flesh and blood. Then he goes into the New Testament, and he goes, therefore, into the Last Supper. And he has a very interesting view of the Last Supper. He, um, he does something quite interesting. He points out the fact, and this is where he goes back into its roots. He says, what, just, what is it, uh, what is the Passover? Why is the lamb sacrificed in the New Testament? Why is it even mentioned? Ah, lamb sacrificed, blood, Oh, yes, yes. Well, this is the way he builds it, starting from that one step. Um, just read a page for you. I think you'll find it quite interesting. The main prohibition of the Jewish law was drinking of blood. Blood was felt to be the life essence of men and animals, and thus the property of God alone, so that every animal killed for food had to have its throat slit and the blood poured upon the ground. 
Therefore, these words were as shocking to Jesus' listeners as if he had commanded incest. For the implication is that if only, if only God may drink blood, to drink blood, and especially the blood of the Son of Man, is to have equality with God, and for that reason, eternal life. The Last Supper, the archetype of the Mass, was held under circumstances which had complex symbolic implications. It is clear from uh, all the four Gospels that Jesus went out of his way to challenge the Jewish establishment in full knowledge that this would bring the death penalty. He therefore brought the situation to a crisis at the time of the Passover. The feast whereby the Jews had always celebrated their deliverance from slavery in Egypt. Central to the Passover was the sacrifice of a lamb at 3 p.m. on Parasivi. That is the day of the preparation for the Sabbath, which is Saturday, upon which the Passover was held. This sacrifice repeated the original Passover sacrifice of the lamb whose blood was smeared upon the doorposts door of the captive Hebrews to ward off the Lord's destroying angel, who on that same night killed all the firstborn sons of the Egyptians. This is the origin of the saving blood of the lamb symbolism. Therefore, when the Jews were therefore in Egypt, Alan then goes back to the roots of this. And he says the whole idea of blood plays a major role because the avenging angel of God took the lives of the eldest sons in Egypt and he could select them from the Jewish sons because the Jews then smeared blood on the doorsteps or the doorposts outside of their homes. And that distinguished them from the Egyptians and therefore the avenging angel could go along and destroy the others. Again, blood plays a major role. So therefore, notice what Alan does with this. This is extremely interesting. Jesus seems to have timed his own death to occur over the Passover and to coincide it with the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. He was putting himself in place of the original lamb to inaugurate a new covenant between God and man, a covenant that would give a new and vaster dimension of meaning to the old Passover symbolism of the deliverance from Egypt. The new Passover is for liberation from death, which the fall had brought about. The new covenant, therefore, has reference not only to the deliverance from Egypt and the subsequent entry of the Hebrews in the Promised Land, it also refers back to the covenant made between the Lord God after, uh, after the flood. And that's that great quote, uh, that the flesh with life thereof is the blood thereof shall not be eaten. And then he quotes Deuteronomy with the great last line, that thou shalt not eat it, but pour it upon the earth as water. Therefore, the old covenant, a sacrifice is a communion, a communion between God and his people in which they take the flesh and he takes the blood. Under the new covenant instituted by Jesus, the people are to have the flesh and the blood of the sacrificial lamb. This is the condition of eternal life. This is divine life, for God alone is eternal. Right, no. He's not going to go to the level of ideas. Now he goes to the level of ideas. He says that um, as you compare the four Gospels, he points out that uh, Luke adds to this, this idea that this Last Supper is to be done in remembrance of him. And uh, here's the quote, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after supper saying, the cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. 
in remembrance of me. So now he takes the idea of remembrance in the Greek, amanasius, and he says, let's take a look at that word. And he takes this word, remembrance, and he says in the Greek, what it really means is to take again, to take again, you must take again and recollect. It's a, a recollection of what was formerly scattered. That's what you do in remembrance. See, you have to collect all of these ideas together. You have to keep them together. So if you're going to do that in remembrance of me, Alan therefore says, look, you have to keep this stuff alive. You have to keep it, you have to be in touch with it. You have to recollect it all together to bring it together into a unity. And therefore, he then talks about, therefore, the idea of remembrance as the key idea behind the, uh, the Last Supper. What does that do? Well, what that does, of course, is to transfer it into a sacrament. This is the process of a sacrament. Now, we don't need a definition for it. We can just see how it's functioning. Therefore, then, Jesus in the Last Supper, as Alan understands it, he's saying, no, no, now you can take what previously was prohibited. I'm going to call the blood, the wine, the flesh, the bread, and now you enter into a new communion a new communion, and in that new communion, therefore, you can participate in the essence of life, which is God's, which is nothing other than, of course, on a, a, a level of ideas, eternal life. Oh. Alan, Alan is very interesting, you see. Um, he explores it on this level, and so he brings it back to the roots and brings it forward again. He knows this material very well. He can bring it together into a new unity. And so the question is, why didn't he midwife Christianity? I mean, why didn't he midwife Christianity? He uses that idea Um, let's see. Um, he, I think I, um, It's a quote I'm so familiar with, and I bet this time I'm going to have <laughs> a little trouble finding it. But uh, I, let me take a moment quickly and talk about it. He sees the need to trans transform Christianity. Um, ah, here we are. He says, it's necessary to recognize that theology is in a crisis. It has faced secularism and humanism, rationalism, and so it compromises with its own past. Alan sees the need to always keep it on the level of symbols and keep alive the images. He says, this is the danger of modern Christianity. There is then no real working out of a new theology or a meta-theology, and thus no framework in terms of which Christianity can find a resolution for its own perpetual state of crisis. No midwife 
for its now over-prolonged pains of labor. Now, why does he say that? You see, he's got this. Why doesn't he then use his creativity to go further and argue for a revitalized Christianity? Ah, it's for this reason. He said, the basic and primary problem that we all face is the problem of the I or the ego or the self, spelt with a small s. He said, that's really the problem. And when we feel this partial existence, this is the real problem that theology has to address. Allen then says that entering into this as a sacrament does not do away with this isolation of the idea of the I, the ego, and the self. It doesn't touch it. This is where he goes. Remember we said earlier that the way in which he proceeds is he studies religion as a natural object like a rose. That's the image he uses. And therefore, he says, when you have a problem with the religion, in this case, Christianity, where there's a difficulty in one of its ideas that it's not fully developed, you then take that idea and study it comparatively. So it's at this point, then, he takes these ideas, and what kind of an idea is it? He says, the sacrament works, you do enter into communion, but it doesn't in any way remove our own sense of isolation. So it's only partially successful. He said, therefore, we have to go beyond theology. That's where he got the title for his book. But what he really means is not to go beyond theology, but to go beyond Christian theology. Because theology exists independently of Christianity. It's Christianity is just a branch of it and expresses only a certain kind of theology. So it's really a Christian theology. He said, the way to go beyond it is to recognize the need to enter and accept pantheism. The eye, he says, is, an, is really, in essence, a distorted image of that which truly is. What truly is. He said, now you have to be able to understand that and see if you can enter into it. When you enter into it and can experience it, of course, this then allows him to go into Eastern thought, and the different kinds of systems that open up possibilities for a mystical experience. And therefore, he argues for the need for mystical experience or profound experiences to overcome the limitations of the ego or the I and the self. But now, Alan doesn't stay there. See, that would make him a comparative religionist. He now wants to take that mystical state, which presumably gave someone an insight that they are not that, fabric, that fabricated and fragmented thing called an I or an ego. That experience then was so pervasive, God, it broke through those barriers. He says, no, 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 you've got to interpret that. You must interpret this experience. in three ways. Have to interpret in three, three contexts. You can't leave it alone. He said, the first is you have to realize that in principle, the whole determines the function and the meanings of the parts. One. He said, that's, for him, a fundamental issue. No part can be understood independently of the whole and the way in which it functions as its meanings must always be related to that whole, which is systems theory. Next, he says, the description of anything must include its environment in space. Now, that can be any kind of space. Look what he did here. In order to make a description of the problem of the Last Supper, he included an environment, a metaphysical environment, a historical environment that brought back and connected it to its roots. Third, he says, what you really have to do is to recognize that analysis only reveals the structure and the behavior of something on a partial level. It's incomplete. What we have to do 
uh, see what the part is and what it does and what it depends upon and what it depends upon is in its place and the relations it has to a system as a whole. So what? Well, that's very complex. What does it come down to? He says, you finally then, in seeing part to whole, here it is, see, let's change it now. The part is the self. The part is the self. That's a little ego. Part is the self. If you want to see its meaning and function, it has to be in relationship to the whole. The whole is going to be the divine. If you therefore must describe your, yourself now from the mystical experience, it must include the entirety, nature. It must therefore include nature. When he includes nature, he's including Taoism. Therefore, he goes further and he says, we must use system theory in order to recognize that Everything depends upon the place in which it is and what it does within it, and that defines what it is. Oh, what does that mean then? Then I, if I'm going to be defined as a whole in terms of the divine and relationship to it, ah, and I'm also going to see myself as a part of nature, then I, I, myself, am it. capital I. Right. I am it. Now, that's a, that's a very interesting thesis because it's, it's current. Um, romanticism comes to that same conclusion. Romantic thinkers come to the same conclusion. And um, Alan, I think, fits in that tradition. Let me give you a, a quote from an interesting one. Um, I kind of, kind of fun to read him. Uh, this is um, Aachen, O-K-E-N, German, 19th century. Um, actually, 1810, if you like the dates. Um, the philosophy of nature is the science of the eternal transformation of God into the world. The realization of God then takes place only gradually through the history of the cosmos. Its primary manifestation and universal condition is time. Time is nothing but the absolute itself. Now I want to move a little bit further into his thought. The absolute reaches its highest point in man, a being capable of self-consciousness. Man is the creation in which God fully becomes an object to himself. Man is the creation in which God becomes fully conscious of himself, becomes an object to himself. Man is God represented by God. God is a man representing God in self-consciousness. Man is God wholly manifested. Man is the creation in which God fully becomes an object to himself. Right? To become an object to himself. That's a rather interesting concept, isn't it? Right? Right? Becomes an object to itself. How is that different than I, myself, am it, when the it is the divine? Then I am the divine? Right. Well, if that's the case, then the divine becomes an object to itself. And therefore, this kind of thinking, and I'd like to read you just a couple of more lines of this, fits it really in the, in the tradition of Schelling. Uh, he's the, another one, Schelling is uh, in the same line in Schellemacher, Jacobi. The self-evident and most fundamental axiom in metaphysics, 
that something cannot come from nothing, nor the superior be produced by the inferior, such a philosophy is a direct contradiction of the law of formal logic. True. But it's true, according to Aachen and uh, Schillemacher. Um, therefore, the most perfect, see, the most perfect, the more perfect, springs from the less perfect, being independent and different from itself. The more perfect has, riven, has arisen from its own less perfect condition. The more perfect God, the divine, has arisen from its own less perfect condition, man. So formally in philosophy, this is called the movement called Romanticism, though the word is, you know, poorly chosen. But that's in the tradition. So Alan fits in that tradition. He uh, talks through it. Right? He reasons his way to this position each time. He does it comparatively. But he has his roots also in the West of the Romantic tradition. Now, let me just uh, have a little fun for a moment, if I may, with this idea of the Last Supper. Um, Alan did some very fine translations. One, of course, is the great Pseudo-Dionysius. He did Pseudo-Dionysius as negative theology. And um, he, he, his Greek was very good. He, he knew the New Testament very well. And this is a section that interests me as it did him. So let me give you the, now I'm gonna work now outside of Alan and try to contrast him for a moment. Um, first I'll give you the structure for a moment. Um, Mark, Matthew, Luke, John over here. And um, as is well known, um, Mark's uh, 677 verses, 90% of it was included in Matthew's verses, which is some 1,051. So what's always important now is to see why it was copied, whether or not it was merely copied or it went through transformations, especially on this most important issue of the nature of the Last Supper and the origin of the entire drama of Christian Mass, because the Christian Mass is an expression of the Last Supper again and again repeated. So, what took place between Mark, Matthew, and Luke? Because Luke, by the way, uh, he borrowed, used, however you want to put it, approximately uh, 55 to 60 percent of Mark, and he also shared uh, approximately a, a, a fourth of the non-Mark material for Matthew and included in his own. So that's, there's also another tradition moving this way. Okay, let me just go back to it. Therefore, Mark is first. Mark, of course, uh, there's some debate about the dates, but I'll give you the more traditional dates. Around 70 to 72, uh, depending upon who you read. Right? But in any case, Matt is said to be about 80 to 82, sometimes they push it to 85. Uh, Luke 
85 maybe to 90, depending. And of course, John is much later said to be 90 plus. The reason I'm doing that is, you see, it gave people a chance to reflect and to think. And Luke, in the beginning of his gospel, says that he collected manuscripts together. He brought them together to write his own gospel. So Mark, in this one section, I'm just going to read a couple of lines. Uh, and he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many. Truly I say to you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. That's it. Matthew, as you can see when I read this, you can see he's, he's taken that material and he's added a little bit here and there. <clears throat> and he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. See, for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Right, so he changed the kingdom of God to my Father's kingdom. Luke. Um, and he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, different, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you, for this is the remembrance of me. So he made it into a sacrament, right? something that is to be done again and again, so that therefore it's kept alive. And likewise, the cup after supper, saying, The cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. <clears throat> Well, there's been a change. The key, one of the key ideas here, in remembrance, right? That idea, remembrance that therefore becomes something that's repeatable, it becomes therefore the sacrament. And then it's for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew, it's for the forgiveness of sins. In Mark, it is not is when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Matthew goes, it's to my father's kingdom. And uh, Luke drops that whole idea out entirely of the kingdom of God and my father's kingdom. Now, <clears throat> What does Alan Watts do, you see? He picks the idea of remembrance. He picks the idea of a new covenant. Therefore, he's anchored in Luke. He doesn't pick up the idea of the forgiveness of sins. He doesn't pick that up. And for the most part, he's going to ignore Mark. Well, <clears throat> Alan, oh, many thinkers <clears throat> who play this game, a noble game, you have to make a decision where you do your basic thinking, through what texts, which one is more central than the other. Now, for myself and for other people who share in this view, the problem in the New Testament is to try to understand the additions, the differences that emerge, and why they occurred. To try to understand each by themselves first, and then look for their additions, differences, and see whether or not their differences are cumulative. That is to say, when, when Matthew used the idea of the Father's kingdom, Here's the idea of Father's kingdom. That's consistent with his idea of the kingdom of, right, the kingdom of heaven. He's the one who uses the expression kingdom of heaven. 
Certainly, kingdom of heaven and my father's kingdom is, are consistent. But in Mark, it's always, right, the kingdom of God. Now, in Mark, they are all exploring again and again, what does this idea mean, the kingdom of God? Well, if you're going to explore the kingdom of God, you have to stay in Mark because it's not used in Matthew. And many times it's, it's, it is ignored by Luke in key places. Now, this kind of thinking that I am now reflecting with you is different than what Alan does. See, Alan reaches into the, he's a, he brings in the history, he brings in the, nearly the sociology, he brings in the conflicts in society, he brings in the average man's thinking, he brings in, as it were, the consensus of thought about things, he represents the average man, the educated man as well, in our day. And he writes for him in this way. And therefore, he can share his own view in this simple way that he has. I find it very profound, very interesting. But this other way of looking at things, which is looking at the differences and trying to come to an understanding of the major ideas within each of the works is something that he takes historically. He'll take it historically. He, won't, he doesn't go into it in depth per se. And that's two different ways of looking at it. And uh, he therefore knows that in order to keep a religion alive, to have it really alive, it should be esoteric. There should be a level of mystery to it. It should be a level of mystery which people can be introduced to and be brought in through sacraments and live it, knowing the roots of it. But it should not be explained away. However, when he's finished with his writing, he has explained it away. Because the more intelligible it is, the less you have to believe it, you understand it. It loses some of its mystery if its mystery is something that is unknown. So therefore, in the conclusion, when Alan concludes this work, he concludes by uh, a very interesting conclusion, which I'd like to give you right now. He says, when we deal with the full implications of the way in which we have explored this work, I'm paraphrasing for a moment, he said, then we perceive the clouds, the sun, the earth, the stars. We find ourselves, therefore, strangely close to the idealism of Mahayana Buddhism, of Berkeley, of Berkeley, and of Bradley. Because when you then go through one, two, three, you really have left Christianity, you really left Christianity in either of its two forms, and you're now exploring the I, that fragmented self of the I, not in terms of the sacraments, because that wasn't sufficient. He wants you now to understand it in terms of systems. And therefore, when you understand it in systems, I myself am it, it becomes part of that system called romanticism. And that romanticism really is an idealism. Right. That is to say, it is the idealism of Mahayana Buddhism, Berkeley, and Bradley. Why? Because I myself am it. It's going to finally come down to what are we but a projection of God and uh, nothing other than a projection in the mind of God. Therefore, the only reality that there is is an idea. And so he, in, he, he has this interesting way, therefore, of wanting always to keep alive the most... Uh, modern, the most innovative views in science, and to bring them into his own thinking. And in that sense, he's like St. Thomas Aquinas and Aristotle. You know, they want to bring in, uh, they want to bring in that kind of thought. The, they want to keep in touch with what's going on in the sciences and bring it into themselves. 
For what we, I'm concluding, for in the light of what we now know in physical terms, it is not unreasonable to wager that deep down in the center, I myself is it. As in, as it was from the beginning, is now, ever shall be, world without end. So therefore, he's going to use a comparative study. He's going to use comparative study of religion. He's going to bring in, going back now to our first page, he's going to add not one, two, three, but one, two, three, four. System theory. And that's what Alan has contributed a way of looking at our own traditions, especially Christianity. He moves through them, he challenges us, and he's a lot of fun to read. So that's what I wanted to bring to you today. Thank you. Any questions we can play with for a while? Good. Good, then I'll uh, tell you one part of Alan that I truly enjoy. The way he writes is a certain comic, strict, comic aspect, humorous aspect that he always captures. In fact, it is impossible but to be a true materialist without being a mystic. The would-be materialist who renounces mysticism is either a slob or a bore or both, for there is something profoundly dreary about mere sensuality, the unrelieved panodrama of filet mignon, bosoms, and bottoms. You can turn a phrase, can you? Filet mignon, bosoms, and bottoms. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I have a question. When we're talking about going beyond it and explaining it away, are you uh, suggesting that, that he explains mysticism so well that he takes something? No. He, uh, he explains Christianity. The roots of Christianity, and in that sense, there's no longer a mystery about it. He takes the Last Supper and he then shows its origin, goes back to the fact that this, the idea of blood, the role it has in the Genesis and Deuteronomy, and in the exile of the Jews from Egypt. He brings it all together historically, he brings this together, so it's all explained. I see. Yeah. yeah. So he takes the mystery out of, out of that, but not yeah. the mystery out of no, not out of mystery. Right. Okay. No, 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 no. He, he, he I think the danger that he might have for myself is that um, when he understands mysticism in terms of romanticism, I, I, I think he isn't treating it um, with sufficient strictness. Uh, if he were, then... It would be interesting to look at this, what is really involved when you say, I myself am it. Um, And then he will play with it very much in the same way that I was writing before and reading before of uh, Aachen and Shelley and uh, Schellemacher. Um, I'll take a look at this, see? I myself am it. Uh, this is asserting, right, I am it. 
means that there is this. He's accentuating it, saying that that is what this is, the self, I myself, am right, it. Well, then the self is divine. Hmm. Theological terms, God. Now, to say that means that um, you can find something in you can find something in you called the self that is God. Well then, God therefore is known. It can be identified. There can be a union. It can be participated. Well, then um, take the participation model for a moment. Uh, perhaps we can show it simply in this way. Uh, this is participating in that. Then there is, as it were, a part of us, a part of this us, sometimes called the soul or the self, which can then participate or be in union with it. Does that therefore mean that there is no way in which God is not present in the self? Does that mean that when the self participates in God, or I myself participates in the divine, that there is nothing that is not disclosed to the self in that participation in the divine? Well, then in that case, if that were the point, would it not be that there would therefore in that participation be no difference? There's no difference than whatever God does or whatever you do is equally exchangeable. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How good are you at creation? Ah. Therefore, would you not agree we are led to hold to the notion that even though the self may participate in God, there must be some unparticipated aspect of God, or we don't have make any sense of uh, our, our notions, our fundamental notions. Now, if there is an unparticipated then when the mystic therefore has an experience, is it not possible we must be very careful in the words we use to make sure whether or not there's been a, in some way, an encounter with this versus this, because we know this. This is the everyday I, ego, self. <clears throat> Because clearly this is a participatory statement. The self is divine. Right? That's the self. You're identifying a part of what it is that the soul is or the mind is as self, and you're saying that is what this is. So therefore there's an overlap. There's a participatory model. Well, then there must be something unparticipated. Well, can we possibly then check on mystical works to see whether or not this distinction is being made by them, by some of them? Uh, would some therefore look at this and say, uh, that's not high enough? That's not profound enough? There's still a element of self-consciousness by necessity? By necessity there has to be some sense of a self-consciousness, otherwise you couldn't say the self is divine. Remember when we were talking, or perhaps you remember Basui? 
when Basui saw that there were some traces of self-consciousness in his own answer, in his own view, he, that caused him to break down, which precipitated a major mystical experience, which therefore go, went nameless. This is the nameless. This is beyond theology in another sense. So when he ends with that, I mean, that's a very good ending. I mean, it's a very high and profound state, participation in the divine. But that's not the unparticipated. So going back to your point. Now, what I'm doing, you see, what this presupposes, what I have taken you through, is actually Greek, classical Greek theology. Proclus did a magnificent work which I always try to get people to read, called the Elements of Theology. Now, that's the elements of making intelligible one, two, three. A vastly different kind of word. 211 propositions ordered, as it were, like you find propositions in geometry so that they are connected and they entail one another in a fine structure. The unity is certainly worth pondering about and meditating upon. That's a different kind of elements of theology. So when Alan says beyond theology, he doesn't mean that. Now why Alan never went into Proclus, I don't know. I once asked him about going into Parmenides and he didn't. So, thank you.